Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM, Wickham Sound. I am your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We play unsigned local uh, indie music. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. And we catch up with Twangling Jack Ford over in the Elk Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk and I particularly want to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anybody who is active in the creative scene, who's got mp3s they'd like to share or who might like to be a guest. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound and we're repeated here on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again and you can find us on iTunes, Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts. So this week we are going to be chatting to Andrew Hogger of Hogger's Wolf. But before we do that, we're going to head over to the Rye Light Zone for another reading from J.V. Hilliard, who is a fantasy novelist. And this is from his new book, The Last Keeper, which is available now. And so the blinded man shall pass through the fog and walk on the water. The Tome of Enlightenment. Damis Alaric was dreaming again. This wasn't unusual. He was both blessed and cursed with honoramancy, or the power of the sight. Visions imparted by Erud, the sexless ancient of knowledge. Only those few who were gifted with the Erudian sight could see events that had not yet come to pass, omens that will be interpreted by his sect, the enigmatic keepers of the forbidden. It was the same dream he had had every night. It would always begin like any normal dream, odd yet ordinary, vague and soft. Damis remembered the first dream, but he always remembered this, or he didn't always remember the first dream, but he always remembered the second, the one that arrived in the early hours of the morning and left him only after his ears and eyes were already open. He wandered through the fog, aching from the coldness of the sight, a damp chill pressing through his skin and into his bones, his constant companion since childhood. Damis shivered more violently so than usual, but remembered to send his ritual prayer of thanks to Arud, who was much better at this in his dreams than he was during his waking hours. He paused for a moment to catch his breath and looked around. around. The fog seemed to have grown even closer, and when he lifted his hand unbelievably in front of his face, he could barely make out its silhouette. He took a couple of deep breaths, steadying himself and choking down the urge to panic. There was a sound from somewhere to his right, the calling of a carrion bird perhaps, and the chilling touch of an unseen breeze that did little to blow the fog away. Gathering himself, Damis struck off, choosing the pass almost at random. He walked slowly, carefully, expecting the ground to give way at any moment or for something to loom out in front of him. But there was nothing, just a sweeping, impenetrable field that seemed to stretch on into eternity. He felt as though he had wandered aimlessly for hours, finding no landmark of any kind. He sweated despite the cold and his legs ached. His throat burned from thirst and he felt ready to collapse. His weary limbs trembled uncontrollably and even in every torturous step felt as though it could be his last. The very moment he knew his strength would fail, a massive expanse of still clear water melted out of the fog, glassy before his feet. Distant mountains hugged the far edge of the pool, darkened by the night sky. Damis paused, suddenly remembering that he would, wouldn't be given a chance to drink. He never did, for this is when the blinded man appeared. He watched as the ethereal figure emerged from the mist, hovering over the water's surface and meandering closer to him. It was a man, hunched and cloaked, his eyes hidden by the graying bandages stained with blood, familiar but only in his dreams. His face seemed to twist and change from night to night, growing darker and more haggard, though Damis knew it was the same man each time. He always seemed unable to sense Damis and was certainly unable to see him. Yet when the man was near, Damis never felt safe. He looked like terror and death and emptiness. It was all Damis could do not to scream. As though tied to the same puppeteer strings, both Damis and the man grew still at the same moment. Distantly, Damis registered that something new was coming. His dream had never taken him this far, and and that knowledge was terrifying. He didn't want to know what would happen next, but his mind moved sluggishly, and though he was being slowly trapped as if he was being slowly trapped in hardening amber. Perhaps the fog itself had clouded his mind when he was breathing it while desperately seeking his way. Panic crept up his spine, his eyes diluting as the fight or flight response kicked in. 
The man was so close that Damon could smell the tracks of flesh bl- fresh blood crawling down his cheeks. It smelled of rusted swords and the bile of ruptured organs. The man raised his head, his bloody countenance impassive, his robed arm reaching out for Damon's. It weaved through the air mere inches in front of him as though the man was looking for a stitch in the fabric of reality. Somehow, he seemed to be unaware of Damus's presence, though his gnarled finger was so close to the young man's face that Damus could see the dirt kick beneath the bed of the nails. Damus tried to move again, but his body refused to obey, his mind desperate, uh, his mind's desperate commands. He swallowed his dry throat, savoring the precious saliva, and fought back the tears that threatened to overwhelm him. He opened his mouth and screamed. The shrill sound ripped through the silence like a bell ringing through a sleepy village. Damus's hands flew up in his face as though the force to, as, as to force the sound back in, but it was too late. Damus knew in that moment he had made a fatal mistake. The figure had been made aware of no, what the figure had been unaware of him until then. The stranger turned. Finally, he said with an evil cackle, "You've come for me, Damus Alaric." Damus opened his mouth to scream again, but the mist was sweeping back down from the mountains and swallowing up everything around him. Even the blinded man was no exception, and he melted away from Damus along with everything else. Darkness overcame him, swirling into the blackness of unconsciousness as the stranger's harsh laughter continued to echo in his ears. Damus, wake up, a faraway voice cried to him. You're having a nightmare. His mind began to swirl, and he fought the urge to succumb to the terror, concentrating instead on the soft voice that was calling to him. A calming hand took him gently by the shoulder, and Caspar Luthic, his roommate, drew nearer. He felt an uneasy pang in his stomach at the transition from dream to consciousness. His vision slowly returned, his eyes roaming around the cloister as he looked for signs of the blinded man. It was only then he noticed he was standing and that he had soiled his, uh, his undergarments. You're safe, Caspar assured him, gesturing for Damus to sit. We're here, in our room. You were sleepwalking again. The blinded man, Damus murmured. It it, it was the blinded man. Take some water, Caspar forced a clay mug into Damus's trembling hands. Damus chugged the water as if it were a life-saving potion. When he finished, he wiped his brow and gathered his thoughts. (sighs) Thank you, Caspar. Let's get you to the infirmary. Caspar reached for his cloak and his boots. No, Damus begged. I I I can't. Why, Caspar asked. I'll make sure no one sees this this time. The other low keepers must be asleep. Please, no more embarrassment. I'll change and clean up, but let's keep this to ourselves. Our classmates are relentless. We all have growing pains, Caspar reassured him. The sight comes to each of us differently. Damus found little solace in those words. The sight had cost him more than it had cost Caspar and the other low keepers combined. Very well. Damus relented, or Casper relented. Let, let's get you cleaned up and get you back to bed. I shan't sleep a wink more tonight, Damus confessed. Precept Radu will know if you don't, Casper said. He always does. At least try. As Casper quietly left the cloister to retrieve more water, Damus dropped to his knees and leaned heavily against the wall. He wept slowly, the specter of his prophecy lingering in his mind and the words of the blinded man clutching at his soul. All right, that was J.V. Hilliard with an excerpt from The Last Keeper, his new fantasy novel. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, A. Cobain, and this is The Altered Mindset with Same Street. Shut up. 
look far away to bring it back So we're not stuck in the middle You try to stand, stumble and fall Prince is the love between us Now we both understand the call We're all just stuck in the middle I felt so obsolete You So indiscreet We Will never meet Two sides of the same street
sense of disdain I heard you bitter cry To stay with me you would rather, would rather die All that once was will never be No matter how hard I could dream of love Well the heart does tire To find another it will conspire And I see that look, it's in your eyes Our love, oh it's dead That was Rebecca of Winter and the Danny Danvers Jig by Hoger's Wolf. Before that, we had Same Street by The Altered Mindset. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with the man himself, Hoger's Wolf. Uh, the first question is one I ask everybody. Uh, you may or may not have okay. an answer for it, but it's uh, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Um, it was the biography of Bruce Dickinson. Oh, of, from Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden fame. Uh, but I thought it, it was a great read. He's uh, he's a pretty incredible guy uh, for not your typical rock star at all. Done many many things. Um, so yeah, no, it was enjoyable, thoroughly enjoyable. Cool. Uh, I, I he was uh, he was easy to like. Yeah. Unlike some rock stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's a because he's a qualified pilot, isn't he? So he's taken the band on tour and flown the plane himself and stuff. Absolutely. I mean, he, he was involved in running a small airline. Uh, they were trying to put together a, a sort of massive Zeppelin type uh, venture a wee while ago, but it doesn't look like that got off the ground. But uh, awesome. yeah, lo lo lots of flying stories. So uh, yeah. Cool. Cool. So obviously one of the main things I want to talk to you about today is your music. And I thought a good place um, to begin with would be to ask um, how long you've been making music and where you got your start. OK, I've, I've kind of had two stabs at it. I started when I was about 12 or 13 uh, um, playing the guitar. I, I quite early on got involved in a band which... I was with for about five years um, and we were starting to do things, get gigs. We did um, a Battle of the Bands back then and we won our regional uh, and we're going, I can't remember whether it was uh, a Southern or, or the actual final thing or whatever it was, but the, the lead guitarist at the time decided that uh, it was too early in the morning to get up. Uh, and so we didn't go. Um, which didn't sit well with me at all. And uh, I don't think it was too long after that that I left the band. I was starting to get more interested in folk music then, the band being, if you like, a new wave British heavy metal type of affair. Um, and I was very much into the early Mark Bolan 
Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, setup that he had. Uh, and so I went solo for a couple of years. But uh, back in the heydays of the Spandau Ballets and the George Michaels, um, there, there really wasn't an audience for for that kind of thing. So I gave up. Uh, and about six, seven years ago, I was spending evenings a lot of the time on my own because my wife was practicing reflexology. Um, and I thought, I can't sit here in front of the telly uh, and do nothing. So I I had a guitar. I thought, well, I'll just learn a couple of songs, just see how that goes. And I got the bug again. And I really threw myself into it. Cool. And that's it. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and what instruments do you play? Because is, is that a mandolin behind you on the wall there? Yeah, I'm I'm sort of in the middle of learning. I can I can do some basic rudimentary stuff on it. Yeah. Um, but um, it's it's difficult because I've got fat little digits and squeezing them into that little fretboard is not easy. So, uh, yeah, I play that a lot, but I play the bass in a rudimentary style, as most guitarists can. Yeah. Uh, just sort of following uh, the root uh, note kind of uh, thing. Um, I play a little bit of flute a uh, little bit of penny whistle again it's rudimentary stuff not to a to particularly good standard but enough to to put on a, a recording as a, a bit of uh, extra melody cool and in terms of your recording i wanted to ask what your recording process looks like so um you know let's assume you've written a new song and you're ready to record it can you tell us uh, what the recording process looks like from sort of start to finish yeah well i've got i've got uh, a home setup i use uh, Presonus Studio One. I've got uh, uh, Presonus uh, interface uh, 1824C, I think it is. Uh, so I I basically will start with the rhythm guitar track because that's really what I am. Uh, and then I build the song around that, whether there's percussion to be put in it. I, I'll add the bass, um, vocals, lead guitar, um, sometimes a bit of flute I've put in. Uh, and then the vocal lead guitar is is sometimes last. Sometimes the vocals are last, but they're the they're the two last bits that I do generally with a song. Cool. Um, and like in terms of your sound, how would you describe your sound? It sounds as though you've got quite a few different influences going on. Uh, well, it's it's the bands I listen to are from the seventies. It's predominantly folk and prog rock um so i guess you know it's it, it's it's a sort of folky kind of thing that i do that that's kind of got a, a proggy thing going on because i tend to write longer songs um and they're not particularly dancey or anything like that and uh they're not uh verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus affairs they tend to be passages that you move through so yeah, that, that 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 I mean I don't like to put a label on it, but they're my influences, and I'm sure uh, that those influences come out in how I sound. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's interesting. Would you say that like I mean, is is storytelling a part of what you do? Because I mean, one of the songs you sent to me, for example, is actually inspired by um, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. So it's kind of take almost taking a story and setting it to music, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, take another song, Aoife, that's uh, it, the inspiration for that was the, the Ulster Chronicles, mm -hmm. which is folklore, uh, the, the, the legend of Cucullan, uh, and Aoife is one of the, the characters from that. Um, the White Hair, which again is a folklore story. So yeah, I would say storytelling is, is a big part, big part. Mm -hmm. And do you do you start with the do you start with lyrics or do you start with uh, the music or does it kind of depend? I I write lyrics uh, and I write uh, chord progressions separately and then try and fit them together, which invariably means that the lyrics change dramatically once once I've found a fit <laughs> um, because th there's never a perfect fit. So I'm writing both all the time and then just trying to splice them together. Cool. Um, it's very rare uh, that I'll write a song and then get lyrics for it there and then. Although I did do that with a song of mine called Miss Monaco and I. So yeah, that, that, that's basically how I do it. Cool. 
And one of the things I wanted to ask, um, which I've asked quite a few people, because it's obviously sort of the elephant in the room, uh, which is COVID. Yeah. So, so how has COVID affected your music, if at all? Um, if anything, it was a positive thing because I had more time on my hand to yeah. to practice, to to write. So, yeah, during during the first lockdown and the second lockdown, it, it gave me more opportunity to to devote a bit more time to it um it, and it, it got me involved in things like open mixelate yep. which you know which is a great platform to to put your music on and get um you know a, a reasonable feedback on it yeah um so yeah cool. it, 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 positive i know i was going to ask you about that group i mean how how useful has it been to you and what reasons would you give to people uh for why they should join it Oh, the, you make great contacts, and when you've got contacts, it, it opens up more possibilities for getting gigs, which is, you know, at, at this level, really difficult to come by. Um, especially if, like me, you do a lot of your own songs, and they're not necessarily mainstream sounding kind of things. Um, they're they're a very welcoming, open bunch of people. There's there's no backstabbing or negativity, which you get on some sites where let's say some people rate themselves as, as songwriters uh, and then uh, uh, feel that their their opinion is is worthy of being enforced on yourself and it's not always a, a positive response but it would open mixelate i mean uh, uh, as, as they say uh, uh, any standard um yeah. they're open to it it's it's a it's a great site for any musician to be part of i mean i suppose that reflects open mics in general because you do sometimes go along to one and they they all have their own different vibes and sometimes you do go to one and it feels almost like competitive and everybody's trying to, you know, one up each other. And then you'll go to others where it's like people just want to see people having a go as well. So I suppose it is. It's like online open mic groups are kind of similar to offline open mics in that respect. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely spot on in terms of open mic nights. There are some that are full of uh, people that, that, um, think that uh, they're on the road to something that they're not and uh, that uh, you're just taking up valuable time that they should have. <laughs> cool. So so one of the questions I wanted to ask you, um, and you kind of touched on this, because I wondered, wondered whether, do you only play originals? Do you play covers as well? Um, and if you do do covers, what makes a good cover? Uh, I do do some covers. Uh, I only really do ones that I like. And I think fit in with my sound. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of those would be Lady Eleanor by uh, Lindisfarne. Um, a long forgotten song, not particularly mainstream, but it fits very neatly in with what I do. Um, so, yeah, I will do covers, but I, I, I'm not a covers act. Yeah. And so if someone shouts Wonderwall at me, I've got no idea how to play it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it would not take long to learn. <laughs> I well, just see I, that as a way. I was, was going to say, as you say, that makes it uh, definitely a challenge to to get gigs because, again, um, I mean, you know, I've talked to a few different artists, and you know, some people are very much along that line of they'll play a lot of crowd pleasers and maybe slip in one of their own originals here and there, um, and they tend to play a lot of things like just like what I would call like I don't know, like an old man pub, where it's like the music yeah. is almost just background music, you know. Um, and I think it's very yeah. different when you're playing original tunes, like people who go, the kind of events that you get booked at, I'm sure people go along to listen to the music and to ex be exposed to new things rather than just to have somebody playing an Oasis cover in the background while they're having a pint, you know? Well, I mean, I get a mix. I mean, I, I, I'm not gigging prolifically, but I, I, I do as many as I can. And it's a mixed bag. Um, and you just, you have to take the good with the bad, the good with yeah. the bad. And when I describe myself as, as, as not a covers act, I'm not knocking covers act. I think you very much have to do what you enjoy. And if you enjoy covering other people's songs, and I know some people that are really, really good at it, and they're a great, great act to see. It's just, I don't enjoy doing that. Yeah. Um, but, it, it, you know, in terms of the level that I'm playing at, it, it needs all sorts. Um, but if you're doing originals, it's a slightly, slightly tougher to get the gigs. But yeah. I do okay. 
You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Hoger's Wolf. And this is one of his tunes, Mrs. Monogal and I. I think that's what it's called. That was Mrs. A Monogol and I by Hoger's Wolf. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with Andrew Hogger, Hoger's Wolf himself. Cool. Awesome. Um, so in terms of your songwriting, so you're performing under the name, and check, check my pronunciation on this, Hoger's Wolf? Or is it Hogger's Wolf? Yes. Uh, Hoger's Wolf. Oh, Hoger's Wolf. My surname is Hogger. Yeah, but uh, I perform under Hoger's Wolf just because it's it's slightly less harsh sounding. Yeah, cool. And um, where did the name come from? I mean, surname plus you like wolves. Uh, yeah, I mean, funny enough, uh, I mean, it all starts with with Jack London's novel White Fang, which I've read as a kid, uh, and that led me into supporting Wolverhampton Wanderers as a football club <laughs> just because I like the animal, the wolf. Um, I studied archaeology, so I'm very interested in British history and the Anglo-Saxons, you know, and the wolf was, uh, you know, uh, it, it was a revered animal within yeah. the, the Germanic societies of back then. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that the wolf like that have interested me yeah. uh, over the years. Um, I've just and, um, there's a, there's a when, I, when I started up again, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the hangings are a bit silly, but um, they're, they've actually got material in them to dampen the sound in the room. Ah, clever. So, uh, yeah, uh, they're sound dampeners for stop, uh, stop the echo in here. Yeah. Cool. Um, so do you carry out any other kind of creative pursuits outside of music or do you tend to just focus on the music? Yeah, just the music, really. I mean, I take a lot of photographs in the morning. I do a very early dog walk, which I, I post every day. Um, and some of those are quite good pictures. But, uh, you know, other than sticking them on social media, yeah. I don't do anything with it. I mean, does that give you, like, thinking time? Do you ever come up with, you know, lyrics and melodies and stuff while you're walking? Yeah, occasionally. Um, so we've kind of touched on this, but... Um... Just to, I wanted to know about some some of the acts that influenced you the most. So you've touched on a few of them. Um, are there any you haven't mentioned? Uh, well, I, 
I would say Jethro Tull, Talk Talk, and especially the later Talk Talk, uh, Colours of Spring, uh, Spirit of Eden and Laughing Stock, those three albums, they have, in, in, in all aspects of music, phenomenally influenced me. The, the, the use of space between notes, um, there's no one quite like Mark Hollis to construct a song with with, with such a weight of atmosphere. Um, Jethro Tull, I like very much, and I've liked them from year for years. Uh, Fairport Convention, I like Steel Ice Band. Uh, all very very unfashionable ba fashionable bands, but uh, uh, th that's what I like. Um, uh, I very much like Linda's Farm as well. Uh, who are having a little bit of a renaissance. There, there's a lot of people talking about, um, I forget his name now, but his songwriting uh, credentials, and it's about time too. Uh, and all the, 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 the sort of 70s acts from the Zeppelins to the Purples, all that kind of thing. Um, modern people that I like, there's not too many, um, but I like Aldous Harding. Mm -hmm uh a guy called riley walker and molly Tuttle, who's a bluegrass performer but a phenomenal guitarist phenomenal but they're the three modern people that i would say i listen to and look to in, in some way shape or form emulate yeah um Aldous harding is a she's a very sort of kate but it doesn't sound like kate bush but it's it, it's that kind of very arty creativity going on there it's very visual as well what she does yeah uh, and she's from new zealand and the other two are americans unfortunately there's not very much going on in britain i don't think in the way of <laughs> great bands yeah or musician acts i mean there's obviously great musicians cool so yeah um and so uh, so this one's interesting because i didn't realize you'd had um you'd had that break as well in your music but i wondered like if you could go back in time to when you were first starting out what what message would you give yourself? I mean, would it be to try not to have that break in between the in in between or? I uh, yeah, I'd say don't have the break and practice more. I didn't <laughs> practice enough when I was younger, um, which was part you know part of the reason to to pick the guitar up again is to try and learn it properly. I did a lot of power chord stuff when I was younger, and that that was straightforward. I was I was a rhythm guitarist. And, and, I mean, it, it, it would be called heavy rock now rather than heavy metal. I mean, heavy metal now is a completely different thing. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, it was just lots of power chords, which is not particularly taxing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it gets the job done, doesn't it? But it's, uh, as you say, I mean, it's not, not the most complex thing. Cool. So um, just one last question to end on, really, which is, well, it's two in one, which is what have you got planned next and where can people find out more about you? Okay, uh, I'm just finishing off an EP at the moment. I'm four and a half tracks recorded. Uh, I've then got to mix it and master it, which takes a little bit of time because I'm not, I'm not particularly proficient at it. I'm getting better every time I do it. I'm watching a lot of YouTube videos, so uh, that that's getting better. And if you want to listen to me, I'm I'm on all the platforms. I uh, distribute it with DistroKid. Um, which is a very straightforward way of doing things. You pay a yearly fee and they pop them on all the usual uh, streaming services. Yeah. Um, the payback isn't great, but I don't mind that. I mean, before we had all this, you, you couldn't put your music out there unless you were spending a lot of money yeah. having CDs made and then trying to flog people your CDs. This is very straightforward. So, yeah. you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not a moaner about the, the financial reward of it. I mean, I've, I've got about, so far in the past two years of being published, I've got about 10,000 streams, Yeah, um, which is pretty good. But uh, the reward for that is about $55, I think. Yeah. So, uh, well, that's, yeah. That, that's it as well. I mean, I suppose it's, uh, you know, it's more about being heard than about the money at this stage, because... Because I always think that when people, you know, you'll see people complaining about um, Spotify's royalty rates or whatever. And it's like, unless, yeah. you're, unless you're getting like a million plays, it doesn't really matter anyway. You're arguing over 
you know, ten dollars maybe or something like that. It's like it's better just to get heard. Maybe once you are yeah. getting heard that much, then it makes a lot more sense because suddenly you're you're you know you're talking about a significant amount of money. But you know, at the at the lower levels, I suppose. Well, totally. I mean, it's um, I I'm not at, at the moment doing it for the money. I'm doing it for the love. Yeah. Um, if I could ever make money out of it, it would be great. But um, times against me. Um, yeah. And um, or older men like me are not necessarily what the young generation are looking to listen to. Yeah. Um, it's, it's harder to mark. I guess I, I don't know. Definitely, definitely. Um, so you know, you've got to be, you've got to have a certain amount of reality uh, in your perspective when you're doing this. You're not going to make a fortune. Yeah. And when's that EP? When are you hoping to release that? Uh, March. By the end of March, it possibly will slip into April. But if I can get it done by the end of March, um, that's the plan. Cool. And does it have a title? Uh, yeah, at the moment, because I collaborated with uh, somebody that I met on Open Mixolate, uh, an American lady called Catrice. She wrote uh, the song. She gave me uh, the, the chord loop, as it was, and the lyrics. And I just, we're within the key, well, I changed the key because it, it didn't suit my voice. But I added uh, a couple of bridge-like parts to it um, with a few more chords just to break it up. Uh, so it, her name's Catrice Greer. So the, the EP is going to be called Catrice and the Others Than They Are. And that lyric comes from one of the songs, Others Than They Are, on the EP. And it's a song called The Other Side. Awesome. Cool. So we'll look forward to that in March and possibly April. Big thank you to Hoger's Wolf for joining me. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Hoger's Wolf with Aoife.
That was Wait and Wonder by San Dimas. Before that, we had Aoife by Hoga's Wolf. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. And we're going to head over to the Ilk Shed to catch up with Twangin Jack Ford for this week's album review. Don't touch anything and wear your masks because he currently has COVID. Uh, get well soon, Twanglin Jack. Mott the Hoople, Mott. Mott the Hoople were a rock band. We didn't have genres back then, but we did have a radio programme called Your Mother Wouldn't Like It. A mot was something your mother would not like. They were a bit like the Stones meets Dylan and the band. They were a popular live act and famously did a tour with Queen as a support act, but they never really captured the live act on record and never became household names. Not only would she not have liked it, but as the joke goes, your mother wasn't getting it. So they split. And then David Bowie gave them all the young dudes and there they were on top of the pops camping it up. They were now a glam rock act. Your mother would have liked the furs, the satins, and Ian Hunter's mane of blonde curls. And we thought they would go back to the dark, grungy rock and roll, but one night I was watching the old grey whistle test, and to dancing black and white cartoon figures from a past era, a piano descended through a whole octave like rock and roll Tchaikovsky, and became a saxophone ramp leading into a Cockney Dylan vocal that in turn led to a boisterous sing-along chorus and the punchline all the way from Memphis, and then that descending piano again. The new Mott the Hoople had an album called Mott. With their glam rock remake and remodel, and with the Roxy music sax player and the Thunder Thighs backing singers, the album was better than the David Bowie produced All the Young Dudes album. It is a very big production, but it is never messy and sounds quite amazing for its time, or any time. They were probably looking for the same kind of Phil Spector big pop wall of sound thing that Roy Wood was doing with Wizard at the time. I think they also used the same backing singers. There were the Little Richard blasts of riffing saxes, the Stones-ish riffing guitars, power chords, Mick Ralph's soaring lead and Ian Hunter's trademark Rachmaninoff Dancing Queen piano flourishes all in one big sumptuous mashup. This album has another of their big hits, the brilliantly meaningless rock and roll dance number, Honolucci Boogie. Glam rock lyrics tended to be nonsensical, which somehow suited the music. But Mott seemed to have a tendency to both sing about being some kind of street gang, and also about being rock stars. I'm not sure the platform hills would have been much of a match for skinhead Doc Martins. Mott the Hoople. Mott. All right, thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Hogan's Wolf for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've played. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I particularly want to hear from poets, musicians, performers, anybody with a story to share, anybody who might be a good guest. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. And we're repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. And we're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. So, as always, thanks a lot for listening. And uh, I'm going to leave you with one last tune. This is Wait by Superlord, previous guest on the show. I'll see you next week. (laughs) 